Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Zhu Wu Chen, a professor of finance and also the, uh, the director of the Asia Global Institute at the uh, University of Hong Kong. So first, uh, welcome to this uh, quantitative history webinar series again. Uh, today, we have a very special uh, session. Uh, it's not about a paper or research, but rather it's about how, to, uh, how not to get published uh, by Professor Joachim Voth, uh, as uh, many of you uh, know. Uh, he uh, previously gave a, a, a webinar for us uh, about two months ago. And at that time, uh, he was so kind to want to uh, share his experience and views on how to achieve a, a maximum chance of success for, uh, in an academic career, especially in the areas of economic uh, and financial history. Uh, by way of uh, further introduction, uh, Professor Walsh is a UBS Foundation Professor at the Economics Department of the University of Zurich. Uh, prior to that, uh, before he joined the University of Zurich in 2014, he was uh, a professor at uh, UB, uh, UPF in Barcelona, Spain uh, for many years. Uh, he, as I mentioned, you know, his area of specialization is economic and financial history. Uh, currently, he is one of the joint managing editors of the Economic Journal uh, he's also associate editor at the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Uh, in the past, he was uh, the editor of Explorations Economic History and also of the European Review of Economic History. Uh, he has not only uh, taken uh, responsibility for selecting and uh, uh, rejecting many, many papers, uh, he has published a very large number of papers. Uh, so I, I know some of you have uh, uh, read his uh, background. Uh, his uh, CV is too long for me to, uh, to finish uh, uh, mentioning uh, in, in two hours. Uh, but uh, anyway, so today the format uh, is going to be as follows. Uh, so Pro Professor Voth will uh, share his uh, uh, thoughts initially and then uh, of course, even as he talks, uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box. And then uh, when, when I have a chance, I will select, uh, your, uh, select and read your questions uh, for Professor uh, Walsh. He will then uh, address your questions. All right, so let's go uh, now. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sivo, for that uh, very kind introduction. Thank you all for coming. So this is a bit of a sort of talk, standard talk that I tag on to academic visits. Uh, and it's meant to distill a little bit of advice and wisdom that I've acquired over the years. Uh, as uh, one American comedian once said, the best thing about good advice is that you hand it on. Um, that's the one good thing you can do with it. So that's my intention here. This is what I want to do a little bit. And the first thing I should say is that I don't feel particularly qualified to tell you what to do because I think I have it all figured out. Okay. So, you know, this is not me trying to say this is how it's done and you know nothing. I'm just trying to share some experience and reflections and many of the things that all of you will grapple with in terms of getting published. They never really go away. You know, all you reach is a higher level of Zen uh, in the frustration that comes with the process. And we can reflect a little bit as we go along about why we organize publishing and economics the way that we do and how wise that really is. And, you know, I'd be the first to, to put a couple of question marks behind that. So why do I do this? Why do I tag on this extra talk? Well, as you know, as an academic, you pretty much live and die by your publications. Um, and it's about the quality of ideas, the originality, but it's also just about a lot of small things that go into the publishing process. And I see many, many people with great ideas who fail to get the publications that they deserve. <clears throat> and it's deeply frustrating to me. And maybe if in some limited way I can sort of contribute a little bit to avoiding some of those frustrations, um, then I would have served my purpose. 
So let me tell you about the kind of stupid mistakes that people can make, starting with my own. So my first publication was a paper about German economic history. Uh, there was something that some people were discussing in the literature, and I wrote a small paper as a grad student. And I sent it off to a journal, which hadn't published any of the other papers, but it seemed like a good fit, I thought. And this was in the days before the internet or email or anything. So six months later, I hadn't heard anything. So I dashed off another letter saying, you know, I send you this paper. It'd be nice to hear back. And these people wrote back and said, haven't you seen the latest issue? So it turned out that this paper actually was published already. Okay. So that was the easiest publication I ever got. Um, it was also an incredibly stupid thing to have done because what I was doing, I think, was kind of interesting. And I'd sent it to a journal that was so <laughs> such low standards that they just basically published anything that came in the mail. Okay, so that's the kind of <clears throat> mistake that uh, hopefully none of you will make. Um, but uh, as Sigo said, you know, I've been at the other side of not the submitting side, but actually handling papers for a while, um, you know, starting with some minor field journal and working my way up a little bit if you will. Um, so that's where uh, my background comes from. So what I want to do is just share some reflections, give you some advice, just sort of give you a sense of how this whole game is played, um, hopefully doing some some good. So let me get started with that. Um, okay. Okay, can you all see my screen? Good. Okay. Great. So um what i want to do is i want to give you some hints tips and tricks on getting improving the chance of actually getting published um and make the whole publication experience more productive i can also tell you exactly what you have to do in order to not get published um that's very easy unfortunately just doing the opposite of what it takes not to get published is not a guarantee of getting in okay and I'll also illustrate some of these things just with sort of facts and figures from the journal that I know best, which is the, which is the economic journal, the society journal of the Royal Economic Society. And by all means, if there's anything that comes to your mind, jump in. It's going to be super tedious if I just talk at my screen in my home in Barcelona. Okay. So this is the first thing that I think sort of that's very big picture you need to think about and grapple with okay so this is from a recent jep paper that looks at the publication performance of phds people who got the phd um, at the best american schools okay so how do you how do you read this um so of the harvard cohort on average 30 people only two-thirds ever publish okay so the rest maybe they get jobs uh, in academia try and fail, or they just left academia and went to McKinsey. Um, so the two, one third is already gone. They never actually enter the publication game coming out of Harvard. Okay, and the number for MIT is 70%. So it's 30% missing. Not very different. And then if you look at, you know, this is just scaling quantity by quality. So there's this thing called the AER equivalent uh publication so one AR is a certain length and a certain impact and then everything else can be basically collapsed into this metric so this is what the authors have done here and the stunning thing is if you look at the 50th percentile it's the median of the distribution so the median harvard student phd um, has 0.04 aer equivalent publications six years after the phd Meaning that the best trained people in our profession, in the world, the modal, the mean one, median one of these basically publishes nothing in uh, the big league journals. Okay. And then it's super, super, super concentrated at the very top. So the 99th percentile is totally awesome. MIT 4.7, Harvard 4.3, Chicago already quite a step down, less than three. You go down to the 95th, it already starts to go down a lot. At the 90th percentile, they might get one, maybe one and a half, but that's about it, okay? So this is this strange publishing universe that we as a profession have created in which it's almost impossible to get into those journals that make or break careers. And apart from the top five, 
there's lots and lots of important, interesting research being done. It needs to find the right place. Okay. And often, if you actually look at the standard measure of how good research is, which is citation frequency afterwards, there's actually a lot of stuff being published outside the top five in general interest journals like Restart, like the uh, AEJs, uh, like GIA, like EJ, or in top field journals, say the Journal of Labor Economics, that's very, very widely cited, often better than top fives. But because those citations take a long time to come in, what people tend to do is when you come up for tenure after six years, they hugely overweight the importance of these top five publications. Okay, so other professions do this differently. Economics, for reasons we can debate, that are very interesting, has this three-tier structure that doesn't fully correlate really with academic, academic impact or the contribution to knowledge. And this is the game that you have to navigate. Okay, so let me tell you what, yes, please. Yeah, so uh, Keith Myers asks, aren't these numbers declining for more recent cohorts? So are these numbers declining? You mean, is it getting yeah. harder? Uh, uh, like for more recent cohorts? Yeah, so, so, you know, if we had data all the way up to 2020, wouldn't those numbers be lower? Um, I assume that that's true. Uh, this is getting more difficult. I mean, the AER has added some pages, so has the JPE, but uh, yeah, the competition is, if anything, even fiercer. Um, but, you know, since my punchline here was it's, <laughs> it's yeah. almost impossible anyway, you know, yes, it probably it's gotten even worse. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. One more question from, uh, this is from uh, OLI. How is the first authorship versus co-authorship weighted in those numbers? Uh, it's all equal. So you do one over N. So, you know, if you, if you, write, a paper with, if you write one AER with Daron, then, you know, you get half. Uh, uh, let me uh, mention one more question before I let you go. Um, from uh, uh, Gulam uh, Dodin, three tier structure, um, not top five versus everyone else. Uh, what is uh, so, you know it depends really I mean all classifications are a little bit arbitrary when I said three tier structure I sort of think top fives general interest but not top five and then field journals okay that's what I meant but of course there's a gradient in all of these some of the top fives are better than others some of the general interest journals uh, have a bigger impact than some of the others and with the field journals there's a very wide range Okay. Uh, yeah. that three tiers is just it's just uh, me making it up as I go along. Um, okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Okay. So, what do journals actually maximize? What are they doing? Um, put yourself in the shoes of the people that uh, make the decision on the paper that uh, you want to get um, placed somewhere. So journals care about the impact of the average paper they publish. Uh, we look at this every year, our impact factor, and it's a very crazy statistic. I didn't, didn't really realize this until uh, I became an editor and the people at the publisher explained this to me. The impact factor takes what you publish in one year and then looks at how often it's cited in the same year and the following year. So if a paper comes out in July 2020, then it can it has to be cited in 2020 or 2021. And the number that you see is, you know, 4.7 or whatever it is for the QGE and so forth. That's the number of citations and what is on average a year and a half of citation time. And then they compile it for five years too, but nobody looks at that. Um, so that alone is already a pretty crazy statistic, right? Now, you know, <laughs> is it true that on average, the journals that in those 18 months window score a lot are better and have a bigger five, 10 year impact than the ones that score little, probably. Okay, so what editors want to maximize is this. If we have a lot of papers that get cited a lot, we're happy, but we also want to promote new and interesting ideas. We have a view of what the exciting research agenda is. And then society owned journals like the Economic Journal, we also feel that we should publish a range of papers representing the best 
research in all subfields of economics. So, you know, if I just wanted to tweak the impact factor of the economic journal, I could do that tomorrow. How? Because I should only take two types of papers, monetary policy and happiness research. Those are the highly, most highly cited subfields of economics. So ideally, if somebody writes a paper on how monetary policy, how QE affects happiness, you know, boom, that paper I should definitely take without even looking for referee reports. And of course, we're not going to do that. That's crazy, right? So, you know, especially if you publish theory, that's almost never cited. The citation frequency is very low. So that's going to drag you down. And as a society owned journal, we just do that anyway. We do it because it's the right thing. We don't just want to tweak and manage things. I can think of some competitor journals that do this a little bit differently. Okay. So space is limited. I'll show you some numbers in a second, just how limited it is. And of course, editors and reviewers are mortal. They only have one life. Um, they're already spending a lot of time on the publication process. Um, and that's going to be pretty important in how you think about what you do and how you do it. Okay. So here's some numbers. So illustrating the constraints. Okay. So, so the EJ published 90 papers in 2019 and it received 1,847 new submissions. So that number is up by 600 since 2016. Now, I'm not sure how representative this is, but we are suffering from the inflow of publications, which is a sign of success, but it's also really putting a lot of strain on just the administrative infrastructure. There's this constant flood of papers. We keep adding publishers. So, you know, that this plus the resubmissions, when you say maybe yes, send it back, means that Every editor, every one of the nine editors we have in post has to deal with 223 papers a year. So that's almost 20 a month, which means that basically in two days out of three in a month, I need to make a decision on a paper. Okay. Um, and this is probably the outer limit of what editors can do. So these are the, the numbers for the AER, for example, in terms of total submissions, total uh, papers per editor, as well as the acceptance rate of around 5%. They're very, very similar. Okay. So um, how do you get published or how do you not get published? Um, what are we looking for? We want something that has an impact, ideally gets cited. We want to promote interesting or promising research agendas on which we have a view as an editor. Um, so if it matches with the interests of the editor, that's a good thing. And in order to improve your chances to get published, you should do whatever you can to make the refereeing and editorial pro process simpler. So it's less likely that you're going to get rejected. OK, um, that's what I want to talk about. So how do you do that? Um, you prepare the paper for submission. There's a couple of things you want to ask, uh, ask yourself. So how important is the research question? Yeah, who, for whom is this paper going to be exciting? There's basically three elements to every research paper. Um, question, is it important? Yes, no. We can all agree on what are important questions, more or less. Then how well executed is it? So if you have a PhD worth having, they train you to do this well. You don't make obvious mistakes, but that's a margin that's going to matter in the end. And then is the question of how novel is this? How innovative, how original is this? So put another way, we all have a sort of map of how our area of knowledge hangs together, what's where, how it's connected. And your paper, if it makes a contribution to knowledge, is changing that map. It says, oh, oh, this road here that I thought connected these two dots and I thought it was obvious, it's actually not true. And we need to take this big detour to actually get there. Okay. So this is, you can call this shifting people's priors, but this is really the core issue. Most people know what an important question is. Most people know how to get the applied work or the theory work to a professional standard. But what is the value added? What is the contribution of this thing? How does this change the way I think about the world if I accept every one of your conclusions as the most single most important question? Okay. 
And after that, you just need to say how well written is it, how well organized is it, is it sufficiently focused? But that's more like, it's not unimportant, but it's more like icing on the cake. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with papers that make contributions that are perfectly reasonable and substantial, but not major. And if you have one of those, it's not in your interest to send it to top five journals, general interest journals, because they're not going to take it. Um, you're going to waste a lot of time. And the people in this field and area, in the subfield of economics, say like labor, they will appreciate this. It'll get cited there and the editor will understand what contribution it makes. It's just not big enough for um, the uh, top tier journals. Okay, and that's not a judgment on you or the quality of your paper. It's just a matter of does this match or does it not? Okay, so as I was saying, there's the top five, then there's the second tier of general interest journals. And below that is the field journals with a steep gradient. Um, so you know, some of the top field journals actually very good in terms of impact factor and others are middling, shall we say. Okay, um, so writing. Uh, so here's some advice from Calvin and Hobbes um, on what to do and not to do. And you know, this applies to every paper you write, but also to your PhD. And you know, Calvin is saying here, you know, I used to hate writing assignments, now I enjoy them. I realize that the purpose of writing is to inflate weak ideas, obscure weak, poor reasoning, and inhibit clarity. With a little practice, writing can be intimidating and an impenetrable fault. Okay. So if you want to summarize on how not to get published, that's exactly what you do. Okay. Um, so I even like the, the title, which reminds me of some academic writing I've seen uh, that Calvin came up with, the dynamics of interbeing and monological imperatives in Dick and Jane, a study in psychic translational gender modes. Mm, academia, here I come. Um, so, you know, economics on average isn't quite that bad, but there are papers like this. Uh, I kid you not, uh, I have had submissions where the first word in the title was misspelled. People didn't use a spell checker. Um, so none of you is going to make that mistake. But, uh, you know, the important thing is that you communicate both maybe in the letter to the editor, which is optional, but I would encourage it. But also on the first page, you have to make clear what that contribution is. So this thing I talked about a second ago, how does this change priors? This has to jump out at you from the first page. Okay. So if the results are obvious to a specialist, and they're not relevant to other fields, then you don't go to a, a, a general interest journal. Okay. Some people replicate what other people have done in the model with a couple of modifications and tweaks, and that's valuable. We learn things. It's just not right for quite a few journals. Um, you also need to be sure that you've sort of done everything you can, right? So you've presented it, you've gone to conferences, maybe you need a co-author to handle one particular aspect or method particularly well. Um, so if you have a PhD paper and it's, you know, I have an old method, I have an old result, I apply it to a new situation, new data, or I have a new method and I apply it to some old data, uh, happens in economic history a lot, then that's very interesting, but that's a field journal contribution. And then you need to ask yourself how quantitative it is for one set of journals or how big picture general description it is for another set of journals, okay? If you want to send it to a general interest journal, there has to be a compelling reason. There has to be a compelling reason why this paper would have to be on a graduate class syllabus in the future. So if somebody teaches a specialized paper, say on financial crises, and you've just written something on the railway mania, then you have to have a two sentence punchline for why this paper has to be on that syllabus because it relates to some overarching thing that everybody in this literature on financial crisis has been debating that is now being modified with the insight that you've generated. Okay, and if that's in your paper, make sure that it jumps out at you and you know you can do worse than follow this sort of super cookie cutter three-step procedure on page one, which bizarrely many people do not do, where the first paragraph just says, this is important. And the second one says, Here's all the stuff we don't know. And the third one says, in this paper, I solved this problem 
in this way. This is my contribution. Okay, that's the sort of standard structure that every referee and editor looks for. The second you deviate from it, you're already sending some cognitive confusion their way. Okay. Um, very important. Yes, please. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, here um, we have two questions. One is uh, from uh, Sasha Becker. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, he says, uh, interesting. Why would you encourage? Uh, why would you encourage a cover letter to the editor? Um, so you know, that's uh, that's a very good question. Uh, some people hate getting cover letters because it's extra stuff and extra documents to open, and some people like them. Um, basically, because even the sort of page one structure is a little bit contains too much verbiage, to my mind. I like it if the author explains why they think this paper fits in my journal or, uh, you know, makes an important contribution in a paragraph. Um, and the abstract often doesn't do that, or it's not the ideal thing to do it. Um, the second thing that, of course, sometimes happens is that people tell you, you know, there's somebody here with a I have a competitive conflict or, you know, there's something about the data that I can't share. So, you know, any of these things, I don't want to find them in the uh, online information entry system somewhere down in page five. Uh, if you just put everything I need to know in the cover letter, it's much better. Okay. So the next question is uh, from uh, Shimuro Yaru uh, His question is, uh, what, uh, what with the uh, impacts of personal interests of different sponsors and protectors of journals and newspapers on content of uh, media and decisions of editors to publish or not uh, to publish any article. I, I asked him to rephrase this question and this is what he came back with. Uh, okay, um, I'm sort of guessing a little bit what uh, the question is. So uh, I understand it to say uh, how you know, how much of the personal preferences of the editor impact the decisions that editors make? And I think this is a very important question, right? So the second somebody hands you the key to the house, you have to think as a human being on how you're going to do this. And I think ultimately there's like two types of editors. Um, they're editors who feel that they aggregate the views of others. They're like arbiters or judges they don't get into the paper so much themselves. They take the temperature of the referees. They take, you know, a yes and maybe and a weak yes. And then they say it's a weak yes. Try again. OK. And I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. OK. That's just what some people do. And they feel that this is the best way to deal with papers that are outside the area of expertise. OK. And that's what's the first thing that happens at general interest journals, which is what makes them such a bizarre species. Uh, if you think about it, big picture, you know, who, the most important decision in the careers of junior people, we hand to people who handle papers that most of the time are not in the area of specialization. Okay, So for that kind of thing, that's not an unreasonable thing to do. Now, personally, both from my experience as an author and as an editor, I feel that the alternative model has a lot to recommend it, which is what you could call the strong minded, biased, or opinionated editor um, who reads the paper, who tries to understand what's going on, and then uses the advice from the referees to make up his or her own mind. Okay, And if there's something that doesn't make sense that the referees say, even if they're very enthusiastic about the paper, they just discard it. Okay, In some ways, that's a little bit harder. It costs more time. It makes the process a little bit more it feels more arbitrary. So, you know, you can have cases where three referees say probably not, and then the editor asks for a revision anyway, or the other way around. So for me personally, that works better because I find it very hard to switch off my own judgment. And I also feel that, you know, since there's multiple stops in this process, having opinionated editors at multiple places will in the end increase the chances of having a satisfying intellectual experience where somebody engaged with the paper, he may say no, or he may say no for that reason. Um, but somebody also might say yes. And, you know, it probably increases the variance. But I think <clears throat> as we sort of approach this as a question of should we th 
think that this is an intellectual issue or an organizational issue. It sort of puts the emphasis on thinking about the content. Okay. <clears throat> so by all means, uh, personal preferences enter into this, but of course, uh, you know, and it's up subject to <laughs> possible abuse, but um, I think very few editors really try to abuse the system. I mean, they just have an opinion, they have a view, they think that the research should be going in a particular way. They try to look for papers that make important contributions furthering this research agenda, um, or that speak to issues that they thought <clears throat> should be resolved uh, for a long time. Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily wrong. Okay, so y'all can uh, hear there are three more questions. Uh, so probably we, you want to go faster. Uh, uh, the next one is uh, how does uh, this is from uh, Bo Fu Zhang? Uh, how does the submission uh, the submission fee dictate uh, the paper's uh, uh, acceptance uh, or the publication and submission choices? Okay, so very quickly, <clears throat> submission fees. You know, they're just they're there, first of all, isn't it, uh, uh, deterrent? You don't want a lot of people sending in their papers, especially if they haven't finished thinking about them, just trying things out. So one of the purposes is just to get these ridiculous numbers down. Um, um, <clears throat> they also make editors' life a little bit harder because, you know, if you desk reject, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, you always feel bad. Somebody's just paid you real money and you, know, you look at the paper and then, 10 minutes you realize it's really just not a good fit so um it's a bit of a two-edged sword okay so the next question is uh from uh valentine uh Sadler. uh thanks to Joachim for the interesting talk here's my question should we have a crunchy chart on page one or two uh, that makes our point or only express that uh, verbally okay um so again, there's a lot of personal differences. I like having a graphical representation in a data rich paper that summarizes the whole point where I can get the core idea of the whole paper with data and I can see it. Okay. And that can come on page one or two. So I like that, but not everybody does. Okay. So, but it's part of sort of this communication of what is this paper really about? What do we do? which is what I wanted to talk about next. So uh, there is a temptation, uh, which in many areas of writing and structuring things works very well, to organize things like a thriller. You know, where only on the last page you realize that the murderer was the gardener. And that's the exact opposite of what you have to do with an academic paper. So this is what we used to call the pyramid principle at McKinsey. You start at the very top and everything that people are meant to know, it has to come in the very beginning no surprises, no cliffhangers, no sort of where's this going kind of stuff. Um, so the punchline of each section comes in the first paragraph of that section. It has to be written super simply. So it, it flows easily. Every time your sentence goes over two lines, go and rewrite it until it uh, <clears throat> leaves, you know, uh, no question marks in the mind of an exhausted reader. Use standard terminology. The, you, uh, uh, terminology everybody's been using in this space to make it as smooth and simple as possible. Okay, so one last uh, question before I let you go. This is from uh, David Tsai. What usually distinguishes a yes paper from a weak yes paper? Oh, you know, uh, how different are your children? I mean, you know, it's just so individual and specific to each case. Um, I can think of papers that have a very strong idea and then the empirical evidence isn't quite there yet, but you could think of ways to improve it. You can think of papers that seem to have an amazing identification strategy. You're just not sure that this is really in this literature, a big contribution. You send it back and say, well, you know, maybe the way you apply it to questions here is not quite right, but maybe there's something else on the left hand side you could try and then it becomes a much bigger paper. So that's like a million ways that uh where there's this borderline i think between the two okay yeah. okay okay so you know this is just saying the the same thing with more words uh from <clears throat> uh, coach rain's paper on writing tips for phd students um it's not a travel log it's not a search process just as simply as possible tell us what's coming and what's important and have the most important stuff come early um okay 
um, getting the tone right, you know, uh, it should be lively, engaging, uh, shouldn't be necessarily uh, super technical, should be easy to read, um, uh, but never sacrifice content in favor of tone. Okay. All right. Um, you have to rewrite everything a million times. I'm shocked is one of the things that, um, you know, you, you, didn't, you don't really realize until you get an editor job. There's so much stuff that never sees the eyes of referees, right? You're part of the refereeing process long before you become an editor. You think you've seen a lot of papers and then you get an editor's job. And the first thing that strikes you is that there's all these papers that you never saw and they're amazing, but they're amazingly surprising surprisingly sloppy, poor, unthought out, unfinished. You know, people just put them in email and upload them online and let's see what happens, okay? Um, and that's not in your interest. Uh, even if you don't know the editor, you're gonna, if this is uh, the referees, you're gonna inhabit the same social, intellectual, academic universe with them for many decades to come. Um, and you only have one chance to be the first impression. Um, so many, many things that people, especially when they've just finished the PhD, they try to get it published. The stuff that they send out, it reads like a job market paper. It's much too long winded, wordy. It shows everything, shows all these technical skills or stuff that's pretty standard. So all of that needs to be completely rewritten. So it reads like the standard journal articles of which you will have read hundreds anyway by the time you got your PhD. Okay. So uh, what to do uh, in terms of organizing things, abstract, of course, concise, informative, accurate, uh, introduction I talked about, make everything flow. In the conclusion, you know, if you have policy relevance, that's great, that's where it goes. If you have wider implications or you wanna reflect on the external validity of what you've done, that's the place to do it. Um, you know, make sure that the references are complete and consistent with the text, okay? So this is another dirty little secret in this business that people don't realize until it's too late. On average, if you are a referee and you get a paper, what's the first thing that uh, many people do? They look at the list of references and you know what they're looking for? They're looking for their own name. Why? Are they egomaniacs? Well, maybe some of us are, um, but on average, they're looking for their name because the reason why the editors send it to them is that they are, they made some contribution to this literature. So this is a net part of the uh, uh, territory on which they have left some kind of uh, impact in some form or other. And if the paper doesn't cite them, you're already, they're already a little bit skeptical that the person knows what they're doing, okay? It doesn't mean that you have to have five pages of references just to make sure. No, you have to exercise judgment. Um, so bibliography in that sense, very important. And of course, also in that literature section, giving credit where it's due, okay? So if somebody has already done half of what you're showing here, you have to say, yes, they've done half, but here's the other half and I think it's important. Um, but if you sort of skip over that contribution, that loud snapping sound in the back of your mind, that's your neck, okay? That paper is just having a problem, okay? So um, references, don't underestimate them together with the literature review section in which you really give credit where it's due, uh, but not to the point that you have a separate five page thing on literature and literature review, okay? It's a very hard thing to get right, but super important in this business. Okay. Um, how focused should it be? Well, you know, here's a couple of quotes from people from the RES universe. Richard Blundell's advice is do one thing and do it completely. So, you know, uh, this paper makes three important contributions. Uh, chances are that uh, it's a little bit unfocused and hard to <clears throat> get right. Uh, more of a kitchen sink kind of thing. Um, doing lots of different things that speak to the same issue, that's fine, but focus it on one thing. Um, and keeping it short is also good, okay? So, you know, uh, many submissions that I get nowadays have 90 pages, you know, 40 pages of text and tables and then 50 pages of appendix. Um, that's almost inhuman. I mean, who's really gonna go through that? Who's gonna look at all of that stuff? Uh, you know, again, you need to exercise some judgment um, because it's really not uh, sensible to make people go through that much to judge the quality of your contribution, or as Frank Hahn used to say, if the structure of DNA can be described in six pages, why do we need 90 page submissions in economics? Okay. 
Um, okay. Uh, you should think very carefully where you send your stuff. And then, you know, in addition to what has high impact factor and so forth, ask yourself, do people in the, my literature publish in this journal? And that cuts two ways. If you just do something very similar to something they've just published, they're probably not going to be that interested in it. It does mean that they understand it. Okay. That somebody somewhere had enough judgment to say, yes, in this literature, this is important. So bit of a two-edged sword. If it's the same space, but substantially different, that's probably a good place to go. Do your homework and figure out who the editors are. This is an innovation that's only come in the last five, 10 years that you can actually select editors um, or at least suggest an editor that you think should handle your paper. And the first thing that happens, for example, at the EJ, I would say about half of our submissions have editors' suggestions and the other half doesn't. And of course, we allocate all papers, but if I get a paper and they didn't select me, this just comes from the general pool, then typically I'm a little bit doubtful whether the person has done their homework. It's a lot unclear to me that they sort of know where they're sending it and why we should handle it. Doesn't mean that we're not going to take it. It just sort of shows a little bit less of doing the homework part than, than you should. Um, if there's nobody who's a sort of really close match with your area, and let me just make that concrete so that you know what that means. Um, so <clears throat> if you do financial history and you send it to the EJ, it's going to go to me. Okay. Um, maybe you know, I'm going to step down in a couple of months. There's nobody who does financial history. Um, then you go and look at least at the associate editors. And if there's nobody who's ever played in that space there either, then the chances that they're going to be interested in this are going to be quite low. Okay. So that's just simple due diligence. It costs a little bit of time, <clears throat> but all these things are very transparent. Now you go on the internet, you figure out who the editor is, what have they published. Um, we have a list of associate editors, uh, often it's linked, you just click through to the homepage and you figure out uh, what they say and what they do. Okay, so what happens at the journal? <clears throat> you submit the paper, you pay your submission fee, um, you have this short letter, um, something that we do at the EJ, which I think is great and people just don't use enough is you can submit with reports from other journals. So if your paper just got dinged by the QJE and you get one of these incredibly nice, friendly rejection letters from Larry Katz explaining how, you know, you would have loved to publish this paper, but it's just this little bit short of the bar and, you know, your fellow editor didn't want it. Um, put that in the submission to us. We will just look at the stuff in an ideal case. If the editor knows this kind of literature, he reads the reports, or she reads the reports, um, and then has a view based on his or her own reading of the paper, you can make a decision quite quickly. So I've had submissions like this that I then run past an associate editor. And then, you know, in three weeks or two, you make a conditional accept. Okay. It can also mean that you look at the, this, the advice from the referees at the other journal and you say, yeah, that's a fatal error. Um, the paper can't fix this. <clears throat> it's not going to converge. Thank you very much, but we're just not going to take it. Okay. But it just makes the process a little bit easier. You may want, if you felt you were treated unfairly, you don't want to include those referee reports that happens. That's reasonable. But if you have them and you think they're reasonable together with that submission letter, let us know. And if you've already done things to address stuff, you know, somebody said, this paper's fatally flawed, it's not doing this, it can't do this, that's why we're rejecting it. And it's actually an easy thing to do. You've just done it. Tell me in the letter, send it our way, done. Okay, super easy. Um, that's one thing you can do. What happens at the submission stage? The paper gets allocated to an editor, maybe because you chose him or her, or maybe because it got allocated from the general pool. Um, the editor will skim read the paper um, and decide whether to screen reject it or to send it out to referees. Okay, And this is very important to understand. Um, if somebody screen rejects you, they're trying to do you a favor. What, it doesn't feel like it, but they are. Okay, What it means is the worst thing is if you wait for three or four months and then you get rejected. You've lost a lot of time. You may not learn a great deal from the referee reports. If you do, of course, it's great, but you may not. And the result is a no. And the editor who has seen hundreds and hundreds of submissions will have a sense and a feel that can be wrong, that this is not something that's going to fit. 
Okay. Now I've had papers that I said, I had one paper that I sent to the AER, and the editor screen rejected it in 24 hours. I was very frustrated. And then I sent it to the QJE and they took it and the paper has hundreds of citations. Okay. So editors are mortal. They make lots of mistakes. I'm sure I've made lots of mistakes. Um, but screen rejecting is part of the process and it's essential because otherwise you go nuts. Okay? And no editor I know <clears throat> can do his job or survive without a very substantial share of screen rejections. Um, it varies by editor. We don't have a quota or anything. Everybody decides what they do. I reject about 60% uh, by the time the paper is submitted. And then I can focus time on the rest. Okay? Uh, I used to do 40 and then I decided to bump it up to 60 not because <clears throat> I want to, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> not because I want an easy life. I want an easy life, but who gets it? Um, but because at some point I realized, and this is maybe sort of just a personal quirk, I realized that there's not a huge number, but there's, there are papers with a really good idea. It's just that the execution is terrible. Okay, so exactly the kind of stuff I was talking about a minute ago. And I want to spend more time on those papers. So I made a conscious choice that I'm just going to spend extra time, like, you know, a quarter of my time as an editor looking for these papers. They're clear rejects. They can't be published. There's no point even sending them out to referees because they're going to get killed. But there's something there. Somebody had a good idea. Somebody looked at the literature and said, I have this data that's really going to solve something. And then I re reject it. But I give them a page, a page and a half of suggestions saying, this is really what you have to do. This, there's a great paper struggling to come out underneath this train wreck. And here's the 10 steps you need to take to do that. And if you've done it, send it back. And here's the thing that really surprised me. So this is a big effort, it costs a lot of my time. I think I'm trying to do people a favor, but the number of people who actually then send it back, it's about half, it's about, the proportion is about half. I don't know what the others do. You know, maybe they just can't do it or they're just overwhelmed, but whatever it is, I feel because there's so much that's stacked in favor in our profession uh, of people who are coming from the right PhD programs, who sort of, you know, <clears throat> had big name editors as advisors, and, right? There's a lot of sort of poverty trap style things. <clears throat> Every time you find a paper that's really exciting intellectually, uh, making an interesting point coming from one of the non-obvious zip codes, I felt it's worthwhile making that effort. And maybe I should be happy about the half that does come back, which is often very good. Okay, so screen rejection. <clears throat> Typically, it's because this is not a good fit at a general interest journal, meaning that if you make an important contribution, you didn't communicate it well. Okay, at that point, you can't really judge the execution. As an editor, you just sit there and say, if everything the paper claims is really true, is this literature going to change in a non-trivial way as far as i can tell that's the judgment call that i make and if that could be true then i send it out to referees okay so uh Jokob, Jokob, yes okay. so i've accumulated a few more questions um so one uh, is related to uh uh screen rejections and and, and so on from the journal's perspective uh that is uh, from this question is from uh uh, Yalon Lee, uh, I'm rephrasing his question. That is, uh, given that um, uh, newspapers and uh, popular media publications have been very much affected because of the uh, increased competition for readers' time and so on. So they have been running for their lives. Uh, but for academic journals, uh, do you think they, there has been much impact or effect on the journal editorial decisions because of the, um, you know, the fact that everyone has so much to read on the inter internet, social media, and so on. No one has a lot of patience for, you know, lengthy and uh, complicated arguments uh, and so on. But everyone- you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really great question. So, you know, we live in what you could, uh, you know, jokingly describe as a post Gutenberg universe. Uh, I often have the sense that you're writing things for people who don't want to read. And I have those sense as an author. <laughs> um, and I think it just sort of amplifies the message I was trying to, or underlines what I was trying to say before, which is you have to sort of write with absolute clarity. 
So even if people don't sit down and like in the good old days, you know, with the clock ticking for six hours, read your paper from cover to cover, and instead they just browse, and they just graze a little bit here, a little bit there, look at the introduction, look at the abstract, look at the pa uh, tables. They have to get what's important about this, okay? You okay. can love it or hate it, but that's what you have to do. Okay, so the next question is uh, from uh, Richard Gustafson. Uh, what about publishing books or book chapters by reputable publishers? Is that considered uh, prestigious compared to journal articles? Look, there's many ways to success. So one of the probably the most influential living economic historian is Joe Mokia. Um, and most are, uh, he has some big name publications, uh, including in leading journals. Not a huge number, though. Uh, the main th reason why he's so famous is his books. OK. Um, and book chapters and so forth. Um, so some people, you know, independent of the outlet are just a force of nature in terms of intellectual impact. Um, but the people who are you know, a couple of steps down in terms of uh, genius, uh, like you and me, probably the journals are a better choice because, you know, for every person who does the Mokia path, there will be a hundred who don't get there. Okay, so the next one is from a player you're in. Dear professor, as a postgraduate student, I always hesitate to submit a paper, especially for uh, those good journals. How, how should I, how can I overcome such feelings? Could you provide uh, some experience uh, of your first submission or your first uh, publication experience? Thank you. Yeah, of course, you know, I mean, we don't like being judged, right? Um, you know, I get rejected happens all the time, doesn't feel good, sometimes feels unfair. Um, it's, it's a very rough contact sport that we've chosen to play in by becoming economists. There's other areas of intellectual inquiry like history where, you know, you write a book every five years and that's considered being very productive and you find a publisher, somebody will take it. Some publishers might say no, but it's just a completely, it feels completely different. So here's the, the, the kind of thing that I used to tell myself and still tell myself. Uh, at the moment, your paper is unpublished. If they reject it, it's also unpublished. So the worst that can happen is about the same that you have now. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, this question is from uh, Jingling Wei. What is the proportion of the uh, papers that are screen rejected? So uh, I think the EJ average number is 50. I do about 60. I used to do 40. I know some colleagues who go as high as 70. Mm, okay, so a uh, question from uh, Yu Bai. Thank, uh, thanks for your contribution. Uh, suppose there are two manuscripts that have similar quality uh, you received, but you had already read one before and enjoyed it. The other is new to you. So which one were you sent to the referees? No, I'd probably send out both. I mean, <laughs> if I think that there's a potentially important contributions, um, the, the conflict between two papers, I mean, we're not in the sciences, right? In the sciences, if somebody sends off the paper on Friday and the next person on Monday, then only the contribution made on Friday counts. Um, we're just in a different business. There's no real time stamping and stuff like that. Um, so I think we just have to think about this differently. Okay, well, this is the last question for this round. Huh? from uh, Hugo Horta. As an editor of a journal in a, diff uh, in a completely different field, I do the same. I try sometimes to give a shot to some papers because they have some interesting potential. I do a review and ask the authors to try to improve their paper. Usually I only get around 10% of these papers resubmitted. If you are getting 50%, uh, that is already great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Good. Makes me feel better. Okay. Um, very good. All right. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. So, you know, if the paper doesn't get screen rejected, it gets sent to referees. How do you find? How do I decide where to send it? Well, you look at the acknowledgments. You look at the list of references. You might go and look at what Google Scholar comes up with. Um, 
So you might talk to an associate editor in the area of specialization. The rule of thumb in this business at the EJ is if you assign four reviewers, you're going to get two on average who say yes. Um, so, you know, if it's right in your own intellectual backyard, um, there are people who you could broadly describe as friends and family. Maybe the rate's a bit higher. The further away they are, the easier it is for them to say no. Sometimes, you know, I have 13 people saying, uh, I had to ask 13 people to get two people to review a paper. That's already a bad sign. Okay, that's like somebody not writing a tenure letter. That's a bad sign too. Um, they're not taking the time to advise a journal. Um, so, you know, that may be for quirky reasons. Maybe the grandmother just died, you don't know. Um, but if you, again and again, you're getting unlucky in terms of getting people to accept the paper, uh, I will at some point consider that a bad sign. Okay. Um, if, a if a journal asks you to be a referee, at least make a quick decision. It's nothing worse than it's sitting on your desk for two weeks while you contemplate and maybe, maybe uh, yes or no. Just say yes or no, okay? That makes our job so much easier. Um, okay, so uh, what do the referees want? Well, they try to figure out the contribution. They want to see whether it's focused, it's clear, and they're going to write two things. They're going to write a letter to the editor in which they just give a brief summary of what they think about the paper and why. And then they're going to write a report to you. Okay. And this, to my mind, um, is completely out of control in economics. It used to be terrible and it's still very bad. Why? Because many, many referees write an essay on how they would have written the paper. So a lot of what the refereeing that I see, both at the EJ and elsewhere, is showboating. Just showing off in front of the editor, saying, look, I'm so smart. If I had written this paper, I would have done this, and this, and this, and there's all this literature here that the paper's missing and that and that. So, you know, some of that's valuable, but most of it's not. That's not your job. That's not what you're meant to do. So when I ask people to referee, what do I ask them? I want to know two things. Is this important and is it likely to be correct? I only want answers to those two things. And if I could, I would send you a form where you have to tick a box that says yes or no, okay? And this, by the way, is what some of the science journals do. Write a short report. Don't write me five pages. I don't wanna know how you have written the paper. Write me a short report about the paper you start with a summary and a recommendation. One paragraph, what does the paper do and how does it do it? What's my recommendation? Fit, good, bad, maybe. And then you have a bunch of points and you should number them one, two, three, so that when I write to the authors, I can say, think about point three by referee two. That's very important, okay? Just makes the whole process a lot easier. Uh, try to get the report back in a reasonable amount of time. It's amazing how everybody who's an author complains about how long things take at journals, but the second that people are referees, you know, there's the average referee is quite good, but the tail is incredibly long. And you have some people who after 10 weeks say, oh, you'll have it on Monday, and then nothing happens on Monday. And two weeks later, they say, you'll have it by Sunday. And then they write you a friendly email saying, Starting, I had a case like this with the immortal words, I am such a good citizen. I do so many things for my department. I cannot write this report at all. Okay. Now, don't be that person. Okay. Because that then means that somebody who's just trusted you and waited forever for that report has to go and find somebody else, typically some emergency scramble because the paper has been with the journal for 13 weeks or something. Okay. So, um, Editor's decision, you know, three to four months if we're doing our good jo a good job, can be quicker, can take a bit longer. And typically um, the editor has to make a decision based on seven documents. You might get, uh, you know, the manuscript, three reports, three letters. Um, so you need to juggle all of that in your mind. It takes quite a bit of mental space to just do it. And then you're gonna get one of three things, conditional accepts, uh, revise and resubmit, or a reject. Um, once the paper's been sent out, so in my case, uh, maybe something like 40% of submissions, um, the R&Rs, the uh, offers to revise and resubmit, there may be, you know, 
10% of all submissions. Okay, so a quarter of the ones I send out become RNRs, and the rest is basically reject. Conditional accept is extremely rare, uh, but sometimes you do it, especially if it comes in with a pack of papers from uh, reports from other journals. Okay, so how do you deal with a conditional accept? Well, first of all, you get out the champagne. Uh, you're just the one guy in a thousand or the one woman in a thousand that gets one of these. Um, it's very rare, okay? Um, and whatever they tell you, you should do. Uh, revise and resubmit. This is, you know, as I said, 10% uh, of submissions maybe get an r, &R maybe a little bit less, but 5% get published. So then you ask yourself, what happens? There's a 50% cull rate. That's incredible. And that's mostly avoidable. Um, mostly avoidable. Sometimes there are... Editor's decision will say you need to do X, you can't do X, the paper's dead. Um, it's a tragedy, happens. I've had papers that were R and R to QJE, I couldn't do it, didn't get published. Um, okay, so that's natural, but that's not what happens in most cases. What happens in most cases is that the authors screw it up. So how do you not screw up? You need to re read the reports carefully, of course, but you also need to sort of reflect it's a big complex intellectual task you need to rearrange what your paper is trying to do what they want you to do what you think is solid what you have to <clears throat> modify what you can just throw away okay and the comments of the referees you have to take extremely seriously and the thing that you must not do is to fight the referees i see this mistake all the time especially from junior people so sometimes you don't agree with the referee Okay, and you think the guy's an idiot, and this comment makes no sense. So that may be true, but this is someone who could have, on that beautiful afternoon that he or she spent with your paper, played with their daughter or son, or gone to the gym, or read a novel, and instead they read your paper, and they gave you their best advice. And the minimum you can do is to not be dismissive of it. And the worst thing is to fight the referee and just say, ah, this doesn't make sense. Okay, so if it's outrageously stupid, <clears throat> of course, you can't do it. Um, but you have to be extremely polite and careful. <clears throat> the typical thing, the sort of 80% of mistakes in this space come from doing a token thing. Yes, thank you for this point. We think we already addressed it in footnote 27, and now we've added a line in footnote 27 that clarifies this point per further. Open brackets, the referee has no idea what he's talking about, and you should leave us alone, close brackets, okay? That will kill your paper. If you do that on any significant scale, somebody will be very unhappy. And without the support of the referees, continued support of the ones that are favorable, improving support for the ones that were on the fence, the paper will not go in on average, okay? So when you rewrite the paper, do everything the referees ask and then do some extra and then do some more. Then you write a guide to changes where everyone, the editor and each referee has their little set of pages in which everything that they said, you explain how you addressed it. So you can just take that section of the referee report, you put it in italics and underneath you write your answer. How have you changed the paper? Here's the new table. And <clears throat> make it as easy for them as possible to figure out how the paper has changed as a result of your input. Okay? And do everything and then some. And if you learn to do that well, the chances of final acceptance go up by a huge order of magnitude. Okay? And this is, again, one of those things where Training, network, advice from supervisors makes a huge difference. People have gone to the right schools. They know how to do this because somebody told them this is how it's done. And people with equally good papers who also have an r, &R don't do this and the paper ends up rejected. That's a tragedy. It's an entirely avoidable, stupid mistake. Okay. Um, so, um, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I got a bunch of questions so, uh, again. So this uh, next one is from uh, D Wang. Uh, do editors take into account the affiliation of the author? Uh, there's actually, a, a, for example, if, if a submission is from a, a um, former master's degree student uh, who is no longer affiliated with uh, 
an academic institution? Would that be uh, less favorably uh, treated? And there's also a related question uh, about you know, submission from a lesser known university or interdisciplinary department. Uh, would that be given uh, less consideration by a top journal? No, I don't think so. I mean, <clears throat> you try to deal with a paper, right? Uh, you know, if I get a paper by Daron Achimolu, chances are that I'm not going to desk reject it because I know a lot about his research record. Um, and then there are people I don't know, but uh, don't have a strong prior on, and they're the, the former master's student <clears throat> without an academic affiliation. It's not very different from somebody at a perfectly reputable research university. It's information, but you don't you don't base a decision on that. I think that's just unfair. Okay, so the next one is from uh, Kevin Liu. Uh, how would you deal with referee reports with opposite opinions? Uh, for example, one suggesting rejection and the other suggesting minor revision. Yeah, super important question. So as I said, there's like two models of editors. And the, I'm aggregating opinion editor, he's my, say R and R, you might say no, but um, for them, this is a hard thing to deal with. And you often have kind of complicated things to deal with as, a, as, a, as an author, because they say, you know, satisfy the two referees, one is super happy with everything you've done, the other one wants everything changed, what do you do? Okay, so that's where the opinionated editor model has a big advantage, because <clears throat> in that mode, the editor will say, ignore referee two, points two and three, do one and four, and we're done here. And that again, depends a little bit on the editor. Uh, the opinionated guys and girls will tell you, you do what I tell you and the paper's in, it's a contract. You can do everything, we're done. The caretaker editors of mode one often will say, I can't make any promises. Some people like it, some people don't. You need to flip the people who are unhappy. I'll send it out again and we'll see. Okay, and that often ends up in a non-converging thing where some people just don't agree and the editor doesn't want to get in the middle of it because it's all technical. And in the end, after, you know, three rounds and lots of frustration, the paper doesn't converge. With the opinionated person, it might just not make it even with favorable reports because the person is just, look, I don't see it. Um, but you might also get lucky and you have three skeptical reports and the person says, ah, you know, these crit criticisms, I don't buy them. Just do it. We're, <clears throat> we're mostly done here. One revision, we're done. Um, so it just increases the variance, but uh, you only care about the part of the distribution that's above the cutoff. So in some ways, that's I think it's better for the for the authors. Okay. Uh, the next uh, from Xing Yan Liu. Uh, thank you, Professor. I would like to ask if collaborations between PhD students who have no publication before. Uh, would have a, a good chance to uh, be published, uh, to get published uh, in good journals. Or shall we first try to collaborate with more experienced uh, professors? I think both of those mo models can generate really interesting research. Um, so <clears throat> my first paper that actually came out of a good journal, I wrote with a fellow graduate student uh, who then went to the economic history department at the LSE and became a successful academic. And I think, you know, I think the paper has a perfectly good point and we came up with it together and we just got excited about it and, you know, pushed it. Um, there's a lot to be learned from writing with senior people too, um, right? Because as you can sort of see from everything I'm telling you here, there's like a million small judgment calls that go into doing this right. This is not something I think that can be taught easily. It's more like, how do you learn how to make uh, a chair? Well, you can go and get a book and read it and try it out, or you can stand right next to someone who's making it and then, you know, you watch them and you try a little bit and they tell you not like this, but like that. And I think the sort of craftsmanship model um, in terms of writing papers is very powerful. And you see this time and again, where, you know, of course, there's a promising student and some senior person says, hey, let's write something together. They learn a lot from the process and then they go on to write a lot of really great stuff on their own afterwards. Okay, so the next uh, question is from uh, Zhang Kai Huang. Uh, how much should I do to satisfy the referee's challenge on the exclusiveness of the IV? 
There are endless alternative channels and exclusiveness checks. Well, you should do everything that you can think of and then some. Um, so, you know, reason doesn't come into it. Um, every time you think that you've done enough, you can probably think of a way to do just a little bit more. Unfortunately, that's the way it's played. Okay, so for this round, the last question is from uh, James Cohn. Uh, is your successor at the EJ a historian, assuming that they have found a replacement? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they have one. <laughs> um, but uh, as, as is good academic practice with all sorts of appointments, you don't really get involved in choosing your successor. Uh, I think that'd be a very bad thing if I did that, because then, you know, you basically create a form of inbreeding, stagnation, etc. So uh, for all I know, they're still looking, okay? Um, you know, yes, I do history, but I handle all sorts of papers. Uh, and I think what they're sort of, what they're looking for is somebody who may be able, maybe a good match for history papers, but also is pretty broad. Uh, they just do a lot of stuff. Um, okay. Okay. So yeah. let, me, let me move on here. Um, so that's revision. How do you deal with a rejection? First of all, you know, rejections suck. They feel really bad. It happens to all people. Uh, everyone gets rejected even the most famous people in our profession sometimes. Um, it's not personal. Most of the time it's not personal. Uh, so these referees that I was talking about giving an afternoon of their time, they try to do the right thing. They may not have done the right thing, but they try to give honest, well-meaning, helpful advice to the editor, but also to you. So treat this as a learning opportunity uh, this is the way to get unbiased feedback and take a deep breath. Okay, so here's some advice from Ganesh Stultz uh, from the Journal of Finan Financial Economics that I actually really like. Um, now, I just received a referee's report. The referee's an idiot. What should I do? Okay, and the best thing you can do is just to set it aside for a couple of days, sleep on it, and once you thought about it, Take it seriously. If the referee misunderstood what you're trying to do, then it's your fault. You wrote it badly or it was unclear what the contribution is. And if the referee has made a mistake, then you go and go back to the editor. But it has to be, you know, they think that your proof doesn't work and it actually does or something like that. Okay. It can't be a matter of judgment taste, preference, etc. Um, the thing you should never do is just assume that there are people out there to get you. Uh, and, uh, there's some personal vendetta going on. Those things happen, but they're extremely rare. Okay. If the thing is egregiously unfair and strange, you know, maybe you got three glowing reports and the editor dismisses it in a paragraph or something like this. You can invoke what is called a dispute process where you can basically say, I think this is so misguided. Please take this away from the editor and have somebody else look at it. Okay. And you can do that, but that's equivalent of a nuclear bomb. Uh, so <clears throat> people will look at this, but there's a very strong prior that, uh, you know, typically there's no foul play or anything else. What often happens is that you get referee reports that sound perfectly reasonable and there's, you know, they're, they're just saying, you know, you could do a couple of things differently here, there, have a couple of suggestions, blah, 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 um, which is jolly good. Um, and then the editor rejects and you sit there and you say, ah, what went on? And that's where you have to understand that a very important part of the communication happens in those letters to the editor that the referees write. So those often will contain a lot of sort of negative judgment um, that's not fully reflected in the referee report. And, you know, there's reasons for doing that. Sometimes as a referee, you're quite identifiable. Um, so, you know, you don't want to piss the wrong people off in your field, etc. As an editor, I hate this. If people tell me one thing in the letter and the report seems to be saying something else, it's very hard to explain decisions to the author then. Um, but this happens quite a bit. And, you know, editors are free, and I do this, that I cite a sentence or something from the letter to the editor. The letter itself cannot be shared, but I can share certain segments. And 
you know, if somebody tells me that this is a, an entirely marginal contribution um, to this literature, but then the report says this is an interesting paper on an important topic uh, with a few suggestions for improvement, that's not quite right. Then you're sort of trying to pull the wool over some people's eyes, and that needs to be corrected. Okay. Okay, so that's pretty much all I have in terms of common suggestions and what to do in order not to get published. And I'm happy to take questions. Uh, yes, uh, there, are, there are quite a few more questions. Then the next one is from uh, Hanwei Huang. Uh, there are occasions uh, when, uh, where, where journals offer, uh, reject, and resubmit. What is the rationale behind that? And how should I deal with such offers? Yeah, I mean, this has become more common. And I'm not a great fan of this. Now, to be perfectly honest, I have to confess I've done this too sometimes. So what sometimes seems to happen is that, you know, there's an interesting paper struggling to come out from underneath another paper, right? And then in order to help the author, also to just communicate clearly that this is not a matter of tinkering at the margin, a lot of things need to be rethought. But the core idea somewhere in there is strong enough, you say it's a reject and resubmit, you know, I can't take the paper like this, you have to send it back, you know, and it's not a matter of revising one, two, three. But if you take it apart, put it back together, I see the point that you're trying to make, I like where you're going with this. And that's like the kind of papers that I spend a quarter of my time on that come from nowhere. Um, they're hopeless in terms of execution. Those are rejects too, with an invitation to send back a paper suitably revised where, you know, finally all the bits and pieces speak to each other, it flows and so forth. Good, good. So uh, the next question from uh, Zhang Tan. Uh, for a paper that has been rejected, but not offered a reject and resubmit, when would it be appropriate to resubmit the paper, a revision? At a different journal. At a different <laughs> journal. It depends, you know, if you, if you feel that everything is perfect, um, then you just send it out the same day. Uh, you can't send it back to the journal that's rejected you. There's no reject and resubmit. That's a complete no-no. You, you have to click a box saying it hasn't been submitted before, so you can't do that. Okay, a very strong recommendation. Okay, so uh, from uh, Hao Chen, uh, assume uh, that some referee requires me to cite more papers, uh, which come from the same person who is the referee. Uh, I, I encountered uh, things like that before. Should I also follow their suggestion, even though um, those papers are unrelated to my submission? Yeah, that's, you know, what's known as coercive citations. Uh, that's a very problematic practice. Uh, so there's actually this organization called the Committee on Publication Ethics. Um, they have things that they deal with all sorts of things like plagiarism and procedures and stuff like that. But they also have things to say on this. That's unethical. Uh, people should not force you to cite stuff, especially if it's unrelated. Now, before, uh, you know, you just say, uh, go away. You should tell the editor that you feel you're being forced into deciding something that isn't right. So the editor has the final word and is aware of this. The second thing I would say is don't assume too quickly. It may be the case, but don't assume too quickly that this is the, the, whoever they want you to cite is the person writing the report. Um, I've seen the opposite many times. And here's a very small suggestion to keep your sanity. Do not assume that you can figure out who the referee is. I think it's just human nature that, you know, we want identifiable people to influence these life and death changing events, right? It's just our search for meaning as human beings, right? It's what got people to think that there's gods of rivers and you know, Zeus is angry, throwing thunderbolts and so forth. It's the most natural thing that you want to put a name and a face to something. But it's incredibly destructive. You're going to do damage to yourself if you give in to this temptation. Why do I say this? 
So let me just tell you a very brief story. I remember many years ago, I visited an American university. There's another visitor there. We take a walk in the park. And within five minutes telling me of his paper, I go, ha, huh, I remember this. And then I remember that I'd refereed this paper. And the person goes on and on how a very senior economic historian is hating this paper and has all these nasty things to say and the paper inexplicably got rejected with all the reasons that I remember from my report. So they were misattributing what I had said to somebody very senior. Why? Because that senior person, when they gave a talk, had said the same things. Okay. So not only were they angry and pissed off at somebody super senior in the profession, but it was for no reason. And they got it wrong because they didn't distinguish between personal animus and what people in this literature think of this particular contribution, which in this case was just misguided and wrong because we know better. We actually know something about this intellectual territory and this just was wrong, okay? So um, even if you think that, you know, it's this person and they said the same thing at my seminar and they write like this, you know, it, you're not gonna know. It's not in your interest to think that you know, they did it and now take it personally and so forth. Just assume that it's some anonymous force of the universe that wrote this thing. Okay, good. There's a related question from uh, Stephen Morgan. Uh, when a paper has been submitted and rejected more than once, the same referee might be asked to review. What's the ethical consideration here? So the referees often tell you this. So you reach out as an editor, there's an obvious set of people who can referee this paper. Sometimes they will say, I've done this before. Um, what would you like me to do? And then editors, there's like two schools of thought. One says, you know, I want this paper to have a fresh bite of the cherry. Um, so we'll just send it somewhere else. The alternative is to say, you know, information is information. Just, you know, have a look. If it's still the same, they haven't changed any of the things in response to your criticisms, let me know that and show me your old report. Okay, so I don't throw information away, but I'll make up my own mind whether, you know, this is something that I want to take seriously or I want to overrule. Okay, so from uh, Bo Fu Zhang, um, could we email the editor our paper before we officially submit the paper? Because some, some editors suggest uh, that it might be faster uh, if we would actually uh, contact the editor by email first before official submission yeah there's there's like a pre-market where you know especially in the sort of top five journals people chat up editors physically when we could still travel or you know sending them copies just say you know i have this thing and maybe they ask maybe they don't ask but they're waiting to be uh, uh, get an invitation to submit something um that's just part of a normal social interaction. It's not a bad thing. Um, I personally prefer it uh, if, you know, you're not quite sure whether there's a good match. You send me an email and I can look at it for 30 seconds and tell you no, right? Because otherwise you have to go through the whole process of the submission, you pay the fee and so forth. I don't want to get a hundred emails a day saying, you know, I have this amazing paper, would it be for the EJ? Um, so you have to have some genuine doubts uh, whether it's a good match or in the zone. Um, but yeah, I mean, by all means, use your social contacts to sort of help you form a judgment whether this could be a good match at this particular journal, including, you know, if you know the editor, asking them for advice. Okay, here's the last question I will, I, I, I will select from me, and then I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Chi Chen Ma there. Uh, this is from uh, Fei Chen Wang. Uh, if the editor suggests ignoring points one and three from one referee, should one really ignore them? Does the editor send a response letter back to that referee? Yeah, great question. And you know, I've had cases where the editor said, ignore referee two. I'm not worried about any of these points. Faithfully, we ignored referee two. And sure enough, referee two was not happy. And the editor then literally wrote back saying, I've changed my mind. I think now you need to convince referee two, okay? So in the end, the paper came out, but it cost me a very significant part of my life and caused a lot of gray hairs. Um, so 
you know, everybody in this process is a human being. We all make mistakes. Uh, you would hope that this doesn't happen, but it does. So basically, if you can do something with, say, limited cost, even if the editor told you to ignore it, I would do it. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, uh, would you have anything uh, to ask or comment on? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Walsh. Actually, I have a question. So, you know, now many papers uh, are very long, over 50 pages, uh, plus the, a very long yeah. appendix. And many journals actually began to encourage the short and the concise writing. But meanwhile, many authors want to confirm the, the convince the, the, the referee that their analysis is very robust. So they need to add many tables, pages. So like a, like a conflict between the two. So what's your view and suggestion on that? Yeah, so let me uh, expand a little bit on that. So I agree with you that uh, especially as a result of the empirical turn in economics, um, we now write very large papers. Um, everything is sort of right at the size limit for the <laughs> regular submissions. So one of the things that other, some journals have done and that we do at the EJ now too is actually shake, take short papers, explicitly short papers. They're just the length of an AR insight submission because sometimes you make an interesting point, but it doesn't need 40 pages. So it doesn't need a 50 page appendix. You can still have an appendix, and dump a lot of stuff in it, but the paper itself doesn't need 40 pages, uh, whatever it is. So I think that's a that's a healthy process and a healthy uh, innovation. And I was uh, happy that we did that at the EJ because it's going to help us as a profession make it easier to sort of figure out what's happening in other areas, right? So if you look at the science journals, nature, and so forth, you can often get the drift of what they do, even if you're not a specialist in a page or two. Um, and they can always, many, many times, you know, I, I don't even understand the title. Um, so uh, I think this, you know, less is more, I think is super important. Now, uh, as you said, um, many people have these super long papers because they are hoping that this somehow, all the robustness will show that whatever the referee comes up with is uh, taken care of. So that's fine, but this never works anyway. Okay, so it's one of the things that I find frustrating and it's probably deeply structural. Um, if you t think of your best publication, okay, and take the version that you sent in that got published and imagine now for a second that instead of sending it back to the journal where you went through the three rounds of revisions and everything else and the 15 extra robustness, you send it to another journal at the same level. You know, there was a general interest one, you send it to another journal, it was top five, it's another top five. What is the chance that that journal will now say, fantastic, everything pans out. This is like, you know, you've established what it is. It's robust. We take it as it is. The probability of that happening is exactly and precisely zero. They're going to do the same thing again, right? And you're going to have another six, nine, 12, 15 months of back and forth, not like this, revision, etc. So sadly, most of this robustness checking, etc., stuff does not generate transpersonal objective truth. It's basically a form of arms race, an arms race, where the author exhausts the referees by having done so many things that they give up. Okay, and you can't preempt that by having a 150-page paper. Part of the process is just that you've done enough to be reasonable, but you haven't done everything because you can't. It's just not possible. And then whatever the referee comes up with, you do too. And maybe it doesn't become part of the paper. Maybe it goes in the appendix. Maybe it's just in the reply to the referees. Um, but if you keep it a little bit under control, it's just much, e in the initial submission, it's just easier for people to wrap their head around it, right? So it's not in your interest that the referee uh, basically wants to jump out of the window once they open the 90 page paper because it's just so complex and there's just so many things going on that, you know, it's going to take them a week of their research time to just figure out whether there's any small thing that needs to be questioned, etc. Okay, thank you. So time's up. Uh, <clears throat> let's uh, thank again for Professor Walsh's 
uh, excellent talk. It's really useful, especially for PhD students and young scholars about how to write paper, how to publish. So now let's announce the events for next week. Next week, we will have a, have a webinar on financial history. We will invite uh, Dr. Paul uh, Schmelzing from the Bank of England to talk about the eight centuries of global real interest rate. So welcome to register and attend, attend this uh, webinar. So thank you, Professor Walsh. Thank you, Professor Chen. And uh, thank you, uh, all the audience participants. And we look forward to see you again next week. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you.